been told that I must stay on the magic carpet. Because if I move forward, the lighting goes off, and then my video will look like shit. <laughs> so um, a bit about myself first. Um, I started in the music business about 28 years ago. Um, I took a sabbatical from university where I was studying engineering, and I never went back. Because um, I went from doing something that I liked to something that I inherently knew, but not consciously knew, that I loved, and that was music. And um, I'll, I'll get to why music and yoga are very, very similar for me and why I love both. So through those years, I've had the pleasure of working with, um, I'm blessed actually to work with a number of great artists. And one of the key things for me was not just the music, but what those artists stood for. Because um, it was very important that if they became popular, that they could basically shift the world to be a much better place. Um, so if I look at every artist, even you know, from the sort of pop side of an Avril Lavigne, um, you know, she would go into uh, hospitals and spend time with sick kids, or Coldplay in their in the whole push for like fair trade. Sarah McLaughlin's known for many of her sort of pursuits. On the yoga side, um, it could be anywhere, uh, anyone from you know Krishna Das who like played here two nights ago, to a Jai Utal or a Rima Dada or a Donna like Delory. That's all music that really resonated with me. Um, it's very very positive music. It's very uplifting music. And um, that was a very key part of my life. Um, about eight years ago, I walked on to a yoga mat for the first time. Um, very typical male, I think. Um, I'm in great shape. You know, I play tennis every day. I run, I bike. Most humbling event of my life, physically. <laughs> um, I realized very quickly I was in the wrong shape. I was in shape, but I was in the wrong shape. and I was. I, at that point, I had gone through the first half of my life destroying my body, and now I'm going to spend the next half of my life fixing everything that I, that I basically hurt. So um, that was my introduction to you know, yoga, and then about four years ago, we started Why Yoga, and that really came from a point for me where um, I you know, travel a lot, and I would take my yoga mat with me, um, but at a certain point, um, I kind of got tired of changing in closets or doing ad hoc in the sort of middle of a hallway and um, you know, having to carry everything with me, um, jumping, you know, finding that hour within my day that I could actually do a sort of class. And the start of why yoga really um, was selfish. And it was to create a studio that I would love to be a member of. And in in that selfishness is also a, a selfless. Because in doing that, I also understood, as in with music, that, that there's millions of people like me. And if I can create something that I absolutely love, that I have a passion for, um, I will then make a lot of other people aware of it through just me being passionate about it. And I do that with music, where if I love a song, I talk about it. I, you know, these days I tweet about it. You know, um, I, I just talk about it. I love music. If I like it, I've learned to stay away from it and just be a fan. If I love it, I get involved with it. So the start of Y Yoga was really just to create a studio that I absolutely loved, that then I could talk about and try and get everyone who I knew to come and actually experience it, knowing that it, it would ripple out in multiple ways. And as we know, everyone who does yoga even if you rush to yoga, and I find myself rushing to yoga quite often, you know, God, I get there in 15 minutes, God. Um, I come out in no real rush. I come out um, definitely chilled down, and I come out a lot more open, a lot more creative, and being in a, in a creative industry, that is really, really helpful um, for me. And that ripples out. You know, everyone coming out of yoga is either dazed or they're smiling. And that's great, because when you're walking down the um, street, what happens is you start looking people in the eye versus looking down, or you're so consumed with your silent thought that you run into people or you run into things. Um, and, I, and I do that quite often. So what I wanted to speak about today was perceptual intelligence, which really is a, it, it's a mashing of two things. Um, it's something that we do naturally, but we don't really think about. And the, imagination in the opportunity, and that has more to do with seeing the glass half full than like half empty. So 
normally I don't use slides, but this is a short speech, so I thought, okay, I better time myself out, or I can sit here and talk for 90 minutes, and then someone's going to be upset at me. I should be going like this. Stop, stop, stop. So I wanted to start, and we'll switch slides, with perceptional intelligence. So start with things that are working properly. Focus on the mundane. Pay attention to what's not obvious. Now, a lot of people look for things when they're creating something, but when they're looking at a new idea, they usually base it on the exact opposite. They will look at things that are not working properly and go, how can we change them to make them better? I prefer to work on some, I prefer to look at something that is working properly. And a great example of this, and it's, um, it's, it's, it's really the, the society of surplus, in that when a good idea becomes so similar, you see multiple businesses doing the same thing. A great example of this um, in the last 20, 30 years would basically be the car rental business, where you might have started with Thrifty, and now you've got Dollar, and you've got all these car rental places. And they all do the exact same thing. And it's mundane. It's obvious. We're all used to exactly what it is. But someone then looked at that and went, that's great, but it doesn't fit me. So how can I change that? How can I make it fit me? It's, it's kind of that principle of being selfish. I don't want to rent a car for a whole day. I don't need a car for a whole day. I don't want to have to actually go and talk to someone to get my car to rent my car. I don't want to have to fill out the credit card. I don't want to have to go walk around the car to make, to make sure that there's no dents. You know, usually um, part of renting a car is, is about a 20 minute to half an hour exercise before you actually get out of there. So with that thought process came Zipcar. The thought that we don't need to rent a car for a whole day. I only need it for two hours. I only need it because I have to go to my you know, once every two month trip to Costco and, and like pick up the big thing of toilet paper that's not convenient when I'm on the bus. And that's where a very mundane thing, a very thing that we became very, very comfortable with, rather than thinking for some idea that hasn't been thought of, it's looking at it and going, let's just shift it. In the case of yoga, for me, it was simply an infrared sauna. I always thought that you had to go someplace else to have a sauna or have a, like, you know, um, um, a steam. I thought, God, wouldn't it be great to have an infrared sauna for 15 minutes be, before I go into a class? Like, warm me up a bit? Especially in Vancouver, where, you know, the amount of sunshine that we get can be counted on, you know, two hands. <laughs> so it, it, it was, you know, to me, they're, they're, it's looking at the obvious and trying to find something within that obvious versus trying to step away from that. So that's perceptional intelligence to me. So you perceive something and then you, 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 you try and really understand it as far as it goes to you and how it affects you and does it fit you. And if it doesn't fit you, guess what? There's the millions of views. So it means that if you come up with something out of that, you can basically spread it. Next, next slide. How we communicate through design. Um, this is a really interesting one for me because I love design um, with that civil engineering background that I never finished. It was all because I wanted to touch things. I wanted to feel things. And what we focus within the y, within the y Yoga camp is essence. And essence is everything that you don't smell, you don't see, you don't touch. Um, it's everything that's missing. And if you think smell, probably there's more negative connotation to smell than what there is positive. So within a yoga studio, do you really want it to smell? No. You know, maybe, you know, grass smells good to you. Um, fresh cut grass might smell good to 30% of the people, but chances are there will people who maybe had some crisis when they were young that they always had to cut the grass. And they don't want to smell grass. They don't want to smell anything. And they definitely don't want to smell sweat. And they definitely don't want to you know, necessarily smell you know, sandalwood. So to me, essence is what's missing. 
Now, you could also say that hearing and listening is part of that. And for me, and there's a fascinating video um, in, the sort of TED, in the TEDx series about the fact that color is sound. And each color has a different energy to it. It, it resonates at a different level. And it has sound to it. And there's this great video where this fellow um, can only see in black and white. And in the end, they hooked up something to the back of his head that loops around, and it sees color. And it sends vibrations to the back of his head based on the frequency of the color. And he doesn't see color. He listens to color. And he can look at any color and tell you what it is based on the actual energy and the sound coming from that color. So with Inside Why Yoga, color is a huge thing to us. And especially when we know that about 70% of the people coming in are wearing something very bright from Lululemon. <laughs> so we're trying to make the people the color and allow the studio to be their sort of screen, their, uh, their, their empty canvas for their own personalities to basically show up on. And that's why you won't see artwork or any of that type of stuff on it. On it. It's not that it's boring because it's crafted very, very nicely. But the essence is to allow the people to be the actual color. And we constantly play with that, constantly trying to figure it out. Um, every, uh, everything from what we touch to what we smell to what we see. And what we see, again, has an energy to it. And, and you need to listen. And what I love doing, and I'm a bit of a snuffleupagus, I love going into a class or hanging out in the infrared sauna or just sitting in the lounge and listening listening to what people have to say. Because they have the most profound input that I can ever hear. Being in the, being in the center of something, you don't have the same pers perspective from the outside coming in. And I love listening to what people have to uh, say. And as such, I'm, you know, I, I have a very open door policy. And um, probably 90% of what I hear is really interesting. The other 10%, I'm like, oh boy, I don't know what to do with that. Okay, let's, um, dopamine. I love dopamine. Um, coming from the music business, it's all about dopamine. If there's no dopamine, there wouldn't be a music business. Um, that's how you become addicted to a song. You hear a sound or a song you love, it creates dopamine. And all of a sudden, like, you want to hear it again and again and again. I mean, you especially see that in, five, in like, five to six-year-olds. There's a song that they like over and over and over and over. You know, funny enough, that whole phenomenon was the, start of, um, was the start of the end of the music business, was that simple function of dopamine and the ability for a young kid to hear it over and over again. What the music business didn't realize is that the minute you allowed a kid to do that, at a certain point, they wouldn't want to listen to the radio station because they don't play the same song over and over again. And um, guess what? Um, if you're, a, if, if you're a parent, you better have a CD player because a you know, cassette just wasn't going to, going to work and the eight tracks were long gone. So, but what began to happen probably in the sort of late 80s when you know, CDs came, uh, came in and then in the early to mid 90s when cars started having CD players is a behavior changed with inside young kids that they were no longer going to accept music that was pushed at them they were going to pull it. And if they wanted to pull that same song over and over again, that was a behavioral habit that was basically developing. In the end, that was the demise of the CD because the kids just wanted to go pull it from wherever they wanted to. And guess what? Free is better than $17. They get that one song. They didn't want the 14 songs that the artist thought was a great album. They wanted the one song. Maybe if in chance they heard three songs where the dopamine kicked in, then maybe they would go buy the like CD because then they actually saw value in it. So the music business in creating the CD, in essence, created their own demise. The great thing for the music business is it's, it's going to grow over the next five years. Is anyone here from the music business? I, I didn't say that for the sake of just saying it. It's going to grow over the next five years. So now, if you think about dopamine and, and the effect that it has, then you can use music with inside yoga. And I know there's going to be a debate, and that debate is probably actually probably thousands of years old. 
You know, um, I'm, I'm quite sure there was music back, you know, um, 2,000 years ago in, you know, in India when it was 40 degrees, you know, outside and, you know, gurus were practicing yoga. I'm quite sure someone in the background was tapping away or someone was chanting. It's because music creates that, you know, that effect. I've got to think in the, you know, middle of a uh, Baptist class, if a Christian Dawes song came on, it was probably sweet relief because it just, it calms you down a bit. You get so worked up to where you are and you're so going through these power flows that the effect of music calms you. It relaxes you. It changes your mindset slightly and it allows you to go through those flows a lot more consciously than what you might have otherwise. It takes the edge off your focus, makes you relax. And there's one thing that I found out about yoga. The more I relax, the easier it becomes. And that's not because I'm lying in Shavasana. It's just because I'm relaxing my muscles and I'm letting it go. So dopamine is really, really key. And so if you want to have a sad yoga class, go in the minor keys. If you want a happy yoga class, go in the major keys. Like a C major is happy. So if you want a happy, you want to end your you know, class on a happy note, like, you know, pick a song that uses major notes. And you will end, the class will have a certain uplifting that they consciously can't figure out why. Probably because they love that song and that effect and that emotion is what they leave with when they leave the class. You've spent the whole class opening the vessel up. Drop a, a note of happiness in there and it'll be awesome. Now, it's not to say that you need to have music with inside a yoga class. I think silence is absolutely beautiful. And if you go to the thought of essence, silence is the ultimate essence. And silence is the best note in music. I tell artists that constantly because they try and fill every single space with a note or every single space with a lyric. And I'm like, can we please take about half the lyrics out? And they look at you stunned going, but that's my story. I'm saying, you can infer the story and leave it open. And in doing such, you allow the listener to attach their emotion and their story to your story. And in doing that, you create a bookmark. And we all have musical bookmarks. Songs that when we hear, we know exactly when we heard it and what they meant to us. What summer, maybe it was a summer that you got dumped, maybe it was a summer that something else happened, but it's something emotional. Songs are emotions. They're not copyrights, they're, they're not you know, in, you know, intellectual property, their emotions. And that's why music and yoga are so very, very similar. They're each thousands of years old, but they're each focused upon emotion, an inwards emotion. And dopamine's one of those things that joins those two great arts together. Next slide. Imagination in the opportunity. So, next slide after that. Surplus is similar. So I love sur I love sur surplus is similar, and there's a there's a great a great quote that I read about it. Sur surplus is similar companies employing similar people with similar educational backgrounds, coming up with similar ideas, producing similar things with similar prices and similar quality. It's the surplus society. I think for the last 20 years, we've been very much in a surplus society. Now, the interesting thing about a surplus society is it, it tends to mundane things down, which creates an opportunity. And it also focuses on the fact that the um, creators, when they create something really interesting that the consumer can't figure out, they go, the consumer's dumb. And if you've got a, a confused consumer, you've got a confused product. If you have a dumb consumer, you have a dumb product. You need to create products where people's imaginations can take over. Probably one of the best things that the engineers at Apple did was create a platform for imagination. When the iPhone came out, every Almost everyone in the sort of business went, wow, neat, cool, the Mac heads will like it, it's completely useless. What they didn't get is when the application store opened up for that iPhone, they engaged the imagination of millions of people 
to create something that would show up on that screen that they could show their friends. And it was one of the greatest explosion of dumb ideas and great ideas. The dumb ideas flew down the charts, the great ideas flew up the charts. I mean, it's a great idea. Some kid came up with ringtones that were farts. That kid made almost a million dollars in the first three, four months. Then the surplus of similarity kicked in, and there was 80 different types of ringtones that you could buy based on bodily movements. And luckily then it fell down the chart. <laughs> and something far more smart came up the chart. But that's what they did. And I can still remember when the iPad came out. And people went, who's ever going to work on this tab, you know, on this tablet? It's, what are you going to do with it? And I just looked at it and go, hey, um, I could put a barcode on this, and up would pop a 3D rendering of the, of the building that I'm about to go into, whose architecture I'm really fascinated with, and I could actually do a tour of the building before I go into the building, so when I see things, my perception of what I'm looking at is now completely changed. It's almost like when you um, have a guided tour of paintings. You know, I'll go into a museum, I'll look at a painting, go, and then walk away. You come in with a guide, and they tell you the, the set of politics that were happening at that time and how the politics are within inside the painting. And all of a sudden, your perception of that completely changed. And your imagination kicks in to what they're trying to communicate from that painting. Chances are that's not the way that you approached it the first time around. So, of, you know, similar is awesome in that once we hit a sort of tipping point, then we you know, get to create something really, really different. Um, the you know, music business is so much about the surplus of similar. S some new sound breaks through. Within one year, there's 80 other bands sounding the same. You know, we're bound to, over the next five years, hear at least six different versions of Adele that are not Adele. You know, just like we're going to hear six different versions of fun that aren't fun. You know, it's not that they won't be fun. They're not the original fun. And that's music. And that's why every 10, 15 years, we get boy bands and we get girl bands. And they last for about five years, and then they fade away, because then there becomes too, too many, and it collapses. But then we get all of the indie rockers and the hair flowing and all that stuff. And that gets all sort of similar and you know, flows away. And then back comes the girl bands and boy bands. and just goes in this cycle. It's really quite funny to watch. Having been in it for 28 years, I think I've been through it three times now. So I'd say it's about 10 years of cycle. And, and we're just hitting the beginning of another boy band cycle. So if there's any parents here who have a teenage daughter, I have a lot of sympathy on you. You'll be hearing a lot of One Direction and every other variation of that. So let's, let's go on to the next slide. Creative confidence and fear of judgment. Now, this is really interesting. Um, it all comes from when you start to first create. And as a parent, um, I was all about everything that my kids created was absolute magic to me. And it's not just because I thought it was magic, but I wanted to tell them that it was magic. I wanted them to have confidence in creation. Because I knew at some point they would run into a peer within these schools that would look at their drawing and painting and say, I don't like that. That's terribly awful. And, you know, that usually happens at about seven or eight years old, and you end up having a very, dis very distraught child because now they, for the first time, have felt fear within their creative confidence. And it's something that later in life you really have to get rid of. You know, I can, I can remember doing conferences where we get everybody in a sort of drum circle. And you could tell, even, a, even in a music company, half those people have never drummed. And I was one of them. And the fear was huge. They did not want to be there. But we just started drumming. And by the end of it, their confidence in drumming, to a certain level, had come back. They weren't going to go play with a band, but now they were really comfortable drumming. And it's very crucial for us to have that confidence with inside our creative process and not stand in judgment of others. 
because it's within that creative stuff, you know, between artists and suits. They're just as creative as each other. One has confidence, one doesn't. And one will create shields. You know, you will have an, ex an executive working with a design firm, and they'll go, you guys figure it out. Rather than saying, I have this idea, but I can't, I, I don't know how to express it. And I'll sit there with, with um, architects, and I'll use, you know, the word perceptional intelligence. And you, the room goes silent, because they're like, what is that? And I'm saying, it's what you perceive when you look at something. So for me with Inside Why Yoga, I would love to communicate ideas without you actually seeing them. Now, there can be simple ways of doing that with great intent. One thing as simple as before the mirrors go up on a wall, having everyone who worked on, on creating that studio or everyone who's going to work in that studio come and write something on that wall. Then it's going to get covered up. But every single person that did that knows what they wrote and knows where it is. Guess what? You've just changed the energy of the whole studio. Everybody. They see it differently. I'll go back to Apple again. They're as concerned about how the design looks from the inside as how it looks on the outside. Steve Jobs was a stickler at that because he was because having a very Eastern point of view, he understood that the intent that you don't see is the power. It's the power that draws you to it. Right? If I see something that I don't understand like, or a gadget, I, I want to touch it. The first time I saw an iPod, I'm like, what is this thing? Where's the on and off button? It took me half an hour, because I never read manuals, to figure out where the on and off button was. And it was purely by accident, holding down the button going, what the? Then it turned off. That was powerful. I'm like, wow. There's a new way of turning something on and off. But it's, it's that intent. You know, we hear it in every yoga class where the teacher asks us to focus on an intent for that class. In design, you must put that intent in everything that you basically do. And it needs to be honest and it needs to be authentic. Because that gives it a power that you just can't understand. And it's what we don't understand that, that draws us, because we're very curious creatures. So if anyone's going to build a yoga studio here, before you even paint the walls, write, you know, write, you know, write something on it. Write what emotion that you're actually feeling. Don't over, over like think it. Just walk up to it with that Sharpie and write it. Now, you, you can think about it and you know, bring it, but sometimes it's more profound when it's spontaneous because you haven't tried to hone down the thought. You just blah, put it out there. So I, I, I think that's great, and, and we're now doing that with every studio that, uh, uh, that, uh, that we open. And it wasn't just the, the people that work at the desk or the, or the housekeeping staff or the yogis. We also invited the people that built the studio. So you had you know, people who were more used to wearing hard hats writing out quotes or writing out their feelings. Because you know, it probably took maybe 1,000 or 2,000 people at the end who touched everything that went into that studio. So I'd love to have their intents with inside that studio. They're all interdependent. It took all those people to make that work. So that's something about you know, have that creative confidence to basically uh, do that. Next slide. Perceptions become feelings. So kind of touching on, on what we talked about, you know, even just writing behind a wall, that perception, every time that that teacher walks in, that room now is very different to them. They have a different feeling towards that room. Um, it's more subconscious than what it is conscious, but it's basically there. Touch. Touch becomes perceptions. Um, if you touch something and it's, and it's cold, the next time that you see that, you're going to think that it's cold, even though it might be hot. You know, um, water is such a great medium um, for that. 
you know, you, you need to see the steam to understand that it's hot. You know, so that's a, that's a, that's a perception that becomes a feeling because you look at it and you go hot. And hot is now a feeling. So think of that concept when building an actual studio. You know, think of everything that you put in there and how that person's going to flow through that studio is they're going to have feelings. Um, the first time in, the, the feeling's probably going to be confusion. They're going to walk up those stairs or walk in that door and go, okay, I'm fearful of being here. This might be my first class. I'm going to meet my friend maybe. Um, holy shit, what am I going to do? And if you're a guy, it's amplified by, by like 10. Okay? So every touch that that person has, everything that that person sees is so crucial. So what's the best thing for them to see initially? Yeah. Water could be. Just that sound of water uh, could be. For me, it's what I'm looking at right now other people looking at me. All of a sudden, I'm, whew, there's other people here. They're communicating with me with their eyes. So that really simple thing had a profound effect upon our kit studio. Because I was like, I want someone who's sitting in the lounge to be able to see their friend walking in the front door. Because if it's their first time, just seeing their friend completely changed their energy then going through the menage of having to sign in for the first time and sign your life away on that waiver and all that stuff <laughs> calms right down. So the ability to, to connect is huge. Eye to eye is huge. It calms your feelings. Then it's everything else from the smell to the touch. Like what does the counter feel like? Um, what am I you know, walking on? Like all of those things. And if you build them with human flow in, in mind, which for an architect is, is very difficult, because they try and build beautiful things that look beautiful, but can sometimes um, be described as dumb, you know, because they'll create areas where all of a sudden you've got people coming from three different directions and everybody stops because they don't know what to do. It's like I have to stop and stay on this magic carpet. Um, and then people get confused and don't know what to do, it becomes awkward. So you need to do design based on how people walk, on how people use things, on how people interact with things. And obviously, eye-to-eye -eye contact is the greatest guide to, because if someone else is doing it, it's so easy to follow them. Like, you know, yesterday, we're, we rushed into town, Jen and I, and we, we just get, and we got to get, get to Sean Corn in like 30 minutes. We, we, we don't have our wristbands or any of that stuff. But it was so great just following other people. All of a sudden, like, I think we have to go there. because Oh, yep, there's, there's a table there. Someone's looking you know, at my eye. Great. Done. First step of calming down. Second is, where are we going for the class? But before you know it, there's a funnel of people going. You meet a yoga teacher that you've known from a, re from a retreat in Costa Rica. And all of a sudden, the energy of you walking into that class has completely changed. And that's all because of the ability to connect before you actually arrive. So design studios not to make them look beautiful with beautiful walls that, that get in the way. I love walls with inside a yoga room to put your feet up against. You know, there should really, besides the washrooms, really be no walls. And if you need to create zones, do half walls. Like, create pockets of zones, but keep it open. Because in doing that, you then allow this communication to actually happen. And you allow the community to actually develop. And another key thing is you might go, well, then it all becomes noisy. So what we did at the Kit Studio, which is the one that I'm referencing, is we created a quiet zone and we created a social zone. And the separation is just a pair of glass doors. But people have gotten the idea really, really quickly and now they're feeling really comfortable to talk in a yoga studio, which some people frown on. But within the quiet area, they realize that now it's time to chill down and just be quiet and you know, arrive on the mat. You know, so you, you just create these feelings and these perceptions. Last slide. If you try and look deeper, 
you've already missed what you're looking for. And what that means is if you walk through the, through the studio, you're always looking for things. You know, um, some of my staff, uh, it, we've had some famous things. We'll open up a you know, studio, and then three months later, I'll walk, them, I'll walk them through, and they're like, okay, what are we going to add? And I'm like, no, what are we going to take away? And it's really simple things. It's kind of like this. If I was walking into this room, I would, I, I would go, okay, there's actually three different types of light in this room right now. Actually, four, because there's candles behind me. Each of those lights have a different color. To my eye, it, it, it really becomes just a menage. Like, I, I, I blur it out. So how can we take these four colors and maybe only bring them down to one or two colors? So it's what can we take out, not what can we add. And it, we walk through our studios with that process, but we also stop and we watch people. Because we help design these things, so we know how to use them. But I love watching people that have no idea how to use them, or maybe who have been there for a couple of months, and use it their way. And I love the their way part, because the their way needs to become the designer's way, building the next studio. So how people line up for like class, have you ever gone down one of those hall hallways where you can't move? Because everyone's lined up against the wall, but someone steps out to have a conversation with their friend, and all of a sudden you can't get by them? You know, that's basically dumb design. It's not a dumb user or a dumb guest. It's a guest being social with inside the social space. So you need to then change your design in the future to allow their behavior to happen. So it can't be how you want it to be. You need to understand how they want to do it. So don't look deeper. Just look. Because if, if you try and figure out everything that you want to do, you'll completely miss the obvious and the mundane, which ultimately makes the experience better. And that loops me through through that. So I'm going to open this up to a sort of Q, like, you know, Q&A. You can ask me any question you want on the music side, on the yoga side. Um, I'm open to anything. So, And if you don't want to ask a question, then don't ask a question. Sure. You said you feel that the music industry is going to change in the next five years? Yes. Can you talk about that? Okay, right now the, the music industry over the last 10 years has been in, last 11 years, has been in recession. Shifting from the, um, from the physical product to the digital product. Um, 11 years ago it had an absolute monopoly. Um, from the music that you heard on radio, whether it was through the promotions that they would do with the radio stations or through the money that they would pay to get their light music played. They had a monopoly on what was sold at the record store. They had a monopoly on how much you paid for it. And they maximized every single one of those things. Then something called Napster came along. And Napster wasn't created to get an album free. Napster was created to find the music that kids were looking for. Because chances are they couldn't find it in, in their local Walmart that only carried 300 different um, C um, CDs. And a Tower Records wasn't in every like city. So there was, a pro, there was a profound shift from that push society to that pull society. I want to pull the music that I want now, not what you want me to have. And that was the millennial uh, generation behavioral shift that started with the introduction of DCD in, in like the early 80s. So the, uh, the, the music business has spent the last 11 years getting, getting like crushed. It's half the size of what it used to be. Yet there's more music being consumed than what there ever has. There's music in movies, a lot more prevalent than just score. It's in almost every TV advertisement where a decade ago it was surprising to hear music within a uh, TV advertisement. It's almost in every sitcom or reality show or, or like whatever it might be. And there's probably um, the biggest radio station in the world is something called YouTube where people are creating their own music and, creating, and attaching their emotion to the emotion of the artist, which is really what songs are. They are emotions. And that has decimated the you know, phys like physical business. But now the physical business has dropped so much that the digital, from digital downloads, has now matched it and is about to surpass uh, it. So part of the you know, business is losing about 10, 15% a year. 
but the other part's gaining 20, 30 percent a year. So economics says that now that they've reached that inflection point, the music, well, the, the actual business will actually start to grow. So for the next two or three years, the music business is you know, going to be really, really happy. They're all going to be going like this. And then they're going to face another inflection point. And that there's a consumer coming that doesn't pirate music, but guess what? They don't download music. And that's why they're not pirating. They just don't download it. That's not how they consume music. They've got a smart mobile device. They access music. It's, it shifts from being, a, from being a purchase to being a performance. And their, their performance is not what's on the radio. Their performance is their, is their friends and close peers' playlists. The concept of an, of an artist creating an album, it's great. The artist will continue to do that. Guess what? Kids don't care. They create playlists. So my best friend's playlist is the album that I'm currently listening to. Now that's a profound shift because if you think that the music business is, is starting to grow, you know, digital downloads are 20, 30 percent a year, but that marketplace in five years from now will actually start to go down. So this is a blip. But what the opportunity is, is that everyone's going to be listening to music. So it's performance based. It's cloud based coming down with no piracy. Two years ago, with all of the piracy within the digital space, the music companies were only seeing between 5 or 10 percent of the revenue that was actually getting created. Within 5 to 10 years, they will see 90 percent of the revenue that's getting created. The business will grow by 50 to 100 percent over the next 5 to 8 years. It's profound. They honestly don't see it coming. They see one thing coming. What they don't see is the next inflection point that is even more profound. And that might be the last inflection point. I don't, I, I don't know, and hopefully some smart kid doesn't create a black cloud, you know, which competes with the white clouds, you know, for people using smart devices to pull that music down. So the music business is actually going to grow, and artists will actually um, create a greater, in, uh, a greater income from the music that they actually create, which will be great, because right now the, uh, one of the only ways an artist can make a living is to, um, is, is to tour. And the problem is there's too many artists touring. You know, it's no longer an event. It's every single day you can go and see an amazing show. Five years ago, it was maybe once a week, and five years before that, it was once a month. The artists have been forced out of their, out of their you know, studios, and it's like summertime is crazy. There's so many artists playing. It's like the, the, the event part of it has just evaporated. So it'll be good to get them back doing a nice balance of creation and playing, and like playing live. You like see a big you know, debate happening right now. You always get the people who look at an opportunity and, and look at all the negatives in it. I'm not getting paid a lot through my um, you know, sort of you know, you know, um, um, streaming. And I'm like, well, you used to get paid nothing, and now you're getting paid something. So that's 100% gain. And by the way, if you wrote the song, you get paid something. If you performed on the song as a musician, you get paid something. If, um, if, if you, um, so there's the writer, there's the publisher, there's the master owner, and there's the performer. There's four different royalty streams that are actually coming in. So what happens is people look at one and say, that's all I'm getting um, uh, paid. They don't realize they're actually getting it paid in four different ways. Um, this will grow the industry massively. And it'll be great to see people that create actually get paid for great creations. Like that's, that, to me, makes me feel really, really good. Because it hasn't really been that way over like the last decade. I think there's a question in the blue. What are the next steps for Y-Yoga? Next steps for Y-Yoga is um, we're going to build probably about one studio a year in Vancouver. Um, you know, looking at, we've already announced a uh, studio that we're going to put on West 6th. Um, we're looking at a new location for our Richmond studio. Um, one that would be more sort of permanent and you know built into a new to a new building. So you know if anybody knows Richmond, it's it's the city that's getting undone. So um, anything that hasn't been re been recently built built is getting torn down. <laughs> so I'd rather get into something that's that's being recently built so that it's there for the next 15, 20, uh, 20 years. Um, you know we're looking at West Van. You know we're looking at the whole 
you know, you know, low, you know lower mainland. Um, by this time next year, we will have one studio open in Toronto, and by the end of 2013, we'll have a second studio open in uh, Toronto. So um, we've built a community um, with Inside Vancouver that lives very harmoniously with the other yoga um, studios. It's been great to see the whole music, uh, the whole yoga scene in Vancouver just grow. I mean, before we started four years ago, just with Inside Y Yoga, there's 800 classes a week. And it's amazing to see what's happening. And I'm, I'm really, I mean, I'm dumbfounded. Sometimes people will like stop me and they'll tell me their like story from everything from, you know, from having heart surgery to, de to depression, finding yoga, coming here. And the look on their faces, they're alive. They're no longer depressed. And those stories we hear every single week, that is the fuel to make us want to expand this. And the goal, really, really simply, 100 studios in 10 years from now. You know, I, I, it's, it'll make the world a better place. That's Not, right. sorry? You, um, you know, I'm Canadian, and um, there's a complexity with coming into the US that, as a Canadian, just dumbfounds me, um, most of it being political. Um, it, it's the same reason why I'm in no hurry to go into Quebec. Um, so I would rather start where it's a little bit easier. Um, and it's also a strategic thought to this is um, we won't go into a city where we're not going to build at least between six to ten studios. Because it's within inside those six to ten studios and how we build them that we get community. Um, I, I love the fact that for the better part, within a five minute drive, there's three different studios. and. Probably within that one hour, there's probably eight different classes happening. So all of a sudden, um, I'm fitting yoga into my life versus my life into yoga. And in doing that, I've removed one of the barriers that will stop me from getting on my mat. And, and that to me is really, 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 really key. Another really key thing with inside what we're doing is I love the fact that we have a community of teachers that now if they want to, can teach full time. That is amazing. Because when I first started, it was a bunch of part time teachers who were, who were doing it through the love, but they had, another, they had another job. Now, if this is what they want to do and this is their passion and this is their journey, there's now the opportunity to actually do that. I'm not saying we won't go to the US, but um, I'm Canadian and I love Canada. So, yeah. yes. That's you. In the white? Can't see. Got lights in my eyes. I would like to ask you what your top desert island guests are and who what yoga teacher would you like on that desert island this year? Oh God. <laughs> Do I want restorative on that island? Do I want power on that island? <laughs> Do I want to be sore? <laughs> um, for me, uh, desert disc. This will change from month to month. Um, I'm a I'm a bit addicted to dopamine. So when I find an album I love, I play it over and over and over again. So probably the album that I've played the most over the last year is an album by a band called Fun. It's called Some Nights. Um, just because it's very up, very up, very uplifting, and the lyricist Nate is a very positive person. So you get a really positive um, approach to it. The most recent one, which is on constant rotation, is um, a fellow from Australia, who's originally, I think, from Ireland, called um, his, his moniker is Passenger. And he has this album that is um, one of the most unique voices I've ever heard. The lyrics are like mind bending, but the music, I don't know, for what it, maybe it's my Irish background, it just gets in to my subconscious. And obviously, there's thousands of years of past Terry's that absolutely have danced to that music. So that's on heavy rotation right now. Um, yoga teachers, because um, most of my experience is local, although um, Jen and I went to Sean, Sean Corn's class yesterday, which was magical. And you can uh, tell that she's passed that 10,000 hours of uh, teaching, because it's so natural to how she does it. Nothing's forced, nothing's contrived. Uh, um, I think I would go a bit more on the pain side, and probably Chris Chavez. 
you know, I love the man. His energy is amazing. Um, he's a very good friend. And about three years ago when I was in Los Angeles and my lower back had crunched up on me, he came to my whole uh, towel room and, and worked me into stretches that were the most painful thing in my life. But when he was finished, I could stand up and walk around and bend over and do everything that, 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 that I needed to basically do. Um, his knowledge of yoga, his energy in life, and just his knowledge of the you know, body is, is unbelievable. And, you know, he's just a funny guy. Get him in a Japanese restaurant, and he's a hoot. So that's probably the yoga-like teacher. Next question. Yeah. Um, the one thing that I've learned is if you like something, be a fan. If you love something, do it. That's the best advice that I can give. You need to love it. If you like it and think that you're going to make money, you'll have your ass handed to you. Um, if you love it, and, and a great example of this is um, it's a band called Old Crow Medicine Show. It's a bluegrass band. If you look at the typical network roster, it probably doesn't work, except that everyone on the network roster writes their own songs, performs their own songs. They're singer-songwriters, while a, a bluegrass artist is singer-songwriter. They wrote this song called Wagon Wheel. Absolutely loved it. And I told the manager like a decade ago, I love this song. I think this song can sell a million copies. He looked at me and says, you are the only person that has, that has said that to me. I don't believe you. But you love this song. I'm like, yeah. Well, fast forward a decade later, that song has now sold about 860,000 copies. It's about one year away from selling a million copies. Um, I think the band just released their fourth album, entered in the top 10 of Billboard, and they're a bluegrass band. But guess what? They write amazing, heartfelt music. And um, we released it because we loved it. We honestly thought, at least my partners did, that we were going to lose our shirts on it. But we loved it. We played it over and over and over, and that was a total dopamine song. So that's how we sign artists. And that's why this, this artist, Passenger, that's our artist. The artist's fun. It's our artist. I don't pick, I didn't say those for my Desert Island because they're our artists. That's just what I listen to. You know, and at, before Passenger was our artist, I listened to Passenger and fell in love with the record and then, you know, spent the next three months convincing the artist to come work with us because of that passion. So don't like it and think you're going to make a lot of money. Love it and think that you're going to lose your shirt. And guess what? You won't lose your shirt. Way at the back. Hey, it's Patty Moore. Hello, Patty. Thank you, Patty. Thank you. A, Thank you. Legend in your own time. <laughs> Only in your mind, not in mine. <laughs> the other one at the back. Hi. Uh, hi. Uh, my name is Michelle Lebras. Hi, and Michelle. I run a company called Cheetah Learning. Mm -hmm. We do accelerated learning for adults. We've ah. been using yoga in our teaching for 12 years. We've had about 50,000 students. Wow. But I felt we were kind of in the closet with our yoga because we just call it stretching and breathing. Because mm -hmm. we had a lot of corporate America, corporate world, actually, we're all over the world. Yeah. And last year, uh, my mom got brain cancer. Mm. And so I hired a yoga person to work with her. She was an athlete. And we worked with her through her brain cancer. And so she passed away, but she was able to maintain a lot of capability that she wouldn't have. So 
I created a business called Inspired Ego. Hmm. And to help people with transitions with yoga. And I'm trying to figure out how to market. We made our first video. And the video is targeted towards people who are going through really tough life transitions yeah. with yoga. Well, I think the best way to market it is just to tell your story. I mean, tell exactly what you just did, but do it with, rather than them filming me, them filming you. And let that get out there. And you'll be amazed at what happens. Um, it has to come authentically from you. But tell your story. I mean, we are a culture of stories. You know, even if you look at some of the best yoga teachers, they tell stories which humanize in, in a great way and personalize what they're actually trying to, trying to like, tell you. So just start talking about your story, telling your story. Plant those seeds. Other people will water those seeds for you. So start with just, you know, social media. Make sure you know what your hashtag is, which is I forgot what my hashtag is. I think it's T McBride, actually. Um, and, and, and just start talking about it. And it, it'll find its own way out there. Because there's going to be millions of, you know, millions of souls that are looking for that transition point to, like, move on to, like, the next life that where I think yoga could um, be a great peaceful way to maybe help that happen. Right. So, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, do we have time for maybe one more question? Or two more questions, if there's two more questions. Yes. My name is Tatiana. I own a company called Open to Bliss. And I teach two signature workshops. One is called Chocolate Yoga Bliss. Chocolate Yoga Bliss? Oh. <laughs> is, it, is it raw chocolate? Ah, oh. <laughs> so there, so there. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But is why yoga open to something that is not solely yoga, but going into the emotional space of the body and even the sexual parts of yoga? Um, absolutely. I mean, um, one of the interesting things of opening up our Kitsilano studio is it allowed us to take our South Granville studio and turn it into a teacher training workshop facility where it only offers public classes um, at night and through the whole day um, the, the yoga team has built this program of workshops from, you know, you know, everything from what from what you're doing to laughing yoga, to people giving talks, to teacher trainings. Um, it's this amazing space. Um, all you need to do is, f is like phone the office. You ask for um, a lady named L, E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, I think. Yep, and um, have that, and have that, and have that conversation with her. Um, I think they're probably running six to eight workshops a week. And it's a great variety of workshops. And you know, they also run you know, sessions that might be you know, five days long you know, for like two hours each, so more of a progression session type of, type of situations. Um, there's a great group of yogis that run that programming that um, are very open and very passionate about what they're trying to get into the community. Yeah, I think the last question. So Wanderlust seems uh, like a natural fit for you. Music, yeah. for, uh, yoga. And is this your first Wanderlust? Um, this is the first Wanderlust that I've been to. Um, I can re remember sitting down with the creators probably in 2000, I'm going to say 2009 maybe, maybe 2008. Um, that was right when we were getting ready to, to relaunch Lilith, Lilith um, Fair. And we actually talked about it because I obviously have a love of both. And obviously an artist like Krishna Das or Jayu Tal fits, you know, fits in with a Michael Frente and, and, and Mike, Mike all this. And, and we sort of talked about this sort of concept. And, and, at that, and at that point, they're like, we're going to take this into ski resorts in the off season and try and build this thing. And I was like, amazing, amazing idea. Um, if, I, if I can help, you know, let, you know, let me know. But my energies are going towards relaunching Lilith. And um, it was interesting when they were looking at coming up here, um, they called me up and said, OK, this is, your, this is your city. I'm like, it's not my city. But you know, let me know how can I help. Because obviously, um, this is an, 
an amazing combination of arts, um, of two different types of emotion that have been, that are thousands of years old and that are directly interdependently connected to each other. No matter how you look at it, no matter what you know, point of view you have with music and yoga being in combination, they're each thousands of years old and they've each been practiced together. So I love now that they've expanded to four different cities. Um, you know, I think the, the inaugural Whistler thing has been a major success, maybe not financially for them, but definitely emotionally for, um, for them. So it's up to us as a community to make sure that next year it's also financially rewarding to them. Why? So that we're not the last one. There's number five and number like six. And, you know, I need Y Yoga to be profitable. Why? So it can build more yoga studios. That's why. You know, so we need Wonderlust to have an abundance so that they can build more. And I think what they've done and what I've seen in the last 24 hours that, we, that we've been here has been absolute magic. And more than anything, I love seeing thousands of smiling faces. Like, how awesome is that? And people looking at you versus looking, you know, sort of looking, looking down a bit. There's a lot of happiness. This is like, being at like, like a U2 concert. There's a lot of happy people here. So, and on that note, thank you. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend. <laughs>